Hey everyone, welcome to AMC Mailbag, the all mailbag show here on AMC Movie News, where all we do is take your questions. I'm Ashley Mova, and if you've got a question that you want answered on air, you can send it over anytime to amcmovietalk at gmail.com. You could get it answered on Mailbag or Movie Talk, and sitting with me to answer those questions right now is the editor in chief of AMC Movie News, John Campia. John Opa, Edward. everybody! Opa! Woo! Let's break some plates. Yeah, but shh. <laughs> Super Bowl's coming up. I'm all excited. It's mailbag time. You know what? I've decided. I think mailbag is now is official. I think mailbag is my favorite show to do. Yeah? Yeah. I it's, like it. It's, it's so like much more informal and relaxed. It's just a really good time. I enjoy interacting with the viewer questions and yeah. everything. And, and having you as my co host is always good. So, yeah, let's <laughs> right get there, going. Let's get into it. Kate Coleman writes, Hi guys, love the show. I just have one question regarding the lack of female superheroes represented in comic book movies. I recently read a statistic about the New 52, which claims that 48% of the people that bought it were women, yet there is only one woman on the team. Do you think the DCCU will add another female character to its roster in the coming Justice League films, such as Hot Girl or Zatanna, with their own standalone movies? I always thought they could have the Shayera whole version of the Ha. Hot girl uh, character. Oh, you probably don't have you. Could, your thing got probably got cut off there. As hot girl character, uh, looking at her partner after being abandoned on Earth, or as a badass Laura Croft character searching for a secret artifact and stumbling upon lost relics of Thangar. I personally I didn't get that. Yeah, I know. That, um, <laughs> personally, think that the Justice League should have another female member on its team. Well, here's the funny thing about that. It, it's not just you. You didn't just hear it somewhere. There was actually market research done in early 2014 that showed that. Get this. 46.7% of the people buying comic books are female. That blew my mind. Like that, that, that statistic. That's blew my almost mind. like I remember because I first read the question that came and said, I, I read that 47% of the people who bought the New 52 were female. I thought, okay, well, somebody's lying to you. Like somebody's trying to sell you a bill of goods. Then I looked into it. It's like, no, there is market research that shows like the, there's a huge chunk wow. of the comic book buying audience out there that are female and reading them. So the question becomes a very fair one. Is that a question of representation? Like, should the DC Cinematic Universe put in more or, or another female character? And so she mentions Zatanna, she mentions Hot Girl and stuff like that. Here is where I think the problem and, and the solution maybe both kind of lie. Is that I don't, there are two things that I do not think are the solution to this problem. And the problem being an underrepresentation of female characters in, in uh, superhero films. Number one, I don't think the solution is, as some people suggested, changing the sex of established characters. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that's a solution. I don't think people will buy into that. Like, for instance, I know just recently Marvel announced that their Thor is now going to be a female character in the comic books. I don't think doing that, I don't think they have any plans to do that in the cinematic universe, Plus, and I don't think that's the right move for them at all. I think that's just going to alienate a lot of people. I also think that the solution, the second thing I don't think is the solution, is to artificially elevate unpopular existing female characters. And what I mean by that is, is like Zatanna, right? Mm -hmm. Very popular amongst a certain segment of comic book readers is this character, but not popular at all amongst non-comic book readers. As a matter of fact, to like, look guys, even to, to those of us who love the character, okay? And I love Zatanna in her classic Zatanna outfit, <laughs> believe me. But to non-comic book readers, the uninitiated who look at Zatanna, that's a ridiculous looking <laughs> costume to them, right? So I don't know that the answer is to take a character like Zatanna and force her up into the, into the higher echelons of the DCCU, right? I don't think that's the answer either. I think the answer, and I could be wrong here, I'm just throwing this out there. I'm sure there are a lot of different theories, but I think the, the answer is a more long-term uh, approach and a more systemic approach, which is, I think the onus lies with those who create these characters. I think we need more of these female characters created today that are, um, you know, cooler characters, can, you know, hit that chord with both comic book fans and non-comic book fans that can have a broader appeal and things like that. And if the comic books won't do it, 
look, Marvel Studios, there is nothing to say that Marvel Studios can't just create a damn character of their own for their Marvel Cinematic Universe, that DC and Warner Brothers is beholden to only using pre-existing comic book female characters. No rule that says that. Warner Brothers can say, let's create a cool, brand new female superhero, right? I think that's the solution, is to starting... Now, now granted, it's not a quick fix. The quick fix would be... Get Zatanna in there. Make a hot girl movie. That's the quick fix. But I don't think that's the true solution. I think the solution is more systemic. I think you start at from scratch right now. You start developing and creating better, brand new female superheroes. And hey, look. Look at the history of comic book characters. A lot of comic book characters launch and they die real fast because they're not popular and only a certain percentage of them exceed and excel, but those are the ones that stand the test of time. So create a whole bunch of female characters. Yes, some of them aren't going to be popular. Yes, some of them are going to fall by the wayside really quick. But if you're committed to it, I think you'll get a few really, really good ones that will stand the test of time, like a lot of their male counterparts. So that's what I would personally like to see happen. On the topic of female characters, earlier this week on Movie Talk, someone had sent in a question. I can't remember your Twitter handle, but um, it was a great question. They said that Jessica Chastain had shown um, interest in doing a superhero type movie, would you think that she'd be a good Poison Ivy? Well, I mean, here's here's the thing. Whenever we get questions that, that revolve around, hey, do you think A actor mm -hmm. would be a good fit for B role? Well, Jessica Chastain is a great actress. Mm -hmm. So she could play a pot and she'll do great. <laughs> oh, so would pot. Jessica Chastain be a great Poison Ivy? Yes, yes she would. But does that? Does, but that doesn't mean anything because Jessica Chastain would be great as any yeah. character that she plays. So, once again, I don't think the answer is getting big enough named stars to play these female characters, and that will make it work. I don't think that's the solution either. I, I think it's about starting from scratch. All right. Mark Byers writes, Hi, AMC. Thanks for being such a reliable source of movie news. Keep up the good work. My question is, what makes a movie timeless? Films like The Princess Bride, though dated, have a sense of timelessness. How is this? Thanks, and bring on the filthy you mm. must. There's <laughs> nothing dated about The Princess Bride. It's, I mean, it's not like Star Wars, right, where there are visual effects that become dated. Princess Bride is just awesome. Maybe the rats of unusual size. Maybe they look a little bit da dated in the rubber costume. Uh, that's fine, too. What, what makes something timeless? There is no one definitive correct answer for that. So it's all a subjective, individual thing. For me, what makes a movie ti timeless is simply excellence. And, and the truly excellent stories are the ones that hearken on to timeless themes. Like you look at Princess Bride. It's about love. It's about loyalty. It's, you know, those types of timeless themes are ones that will endure. You look at a movie, I've mentioned a lot lately, the... Uh, the Woody, uh, I was going to say Woody Harrelson, uh, the Woody Allen film, um, uh, uh, Annie Hall. Annie Hall, it's a super old movie, but it doesn't feel dated at all because it really relies heavily on the themes that it projects, right? Now, you'll get a lot of movies that come out that rely heavily on pop cultural trends and you know things like that those movies can be great and and that's fine but 10 years from now they're going to feel they're going to wear out their welcome and maybe not even hit hard with new audiences 10 years from now it's like yeah 10 years ago was great show it to a new person today it's like i don't get it because it was made in a certain way but movies like the princess bride and and uh, lawrence of arabia and, and and spartacus and things like that they rely on timeless themes mm -hmm. that transcend generations so that when you watch them they can still hit you to your core because these are still themes and elements and priorities and, and virtues that we hold dear and, and invest in and celebrate today. So that kind of gives them a timeless aspect as well. So, so true. Did you see Princess Bride 2? What? Princess Bride 2. Did there is no it? Princess Bride 2. Yeah. Fact checker, Jonathan. There is a Princess Bride <laughs> Jonathan's already on it. Princess Bride 2, what are you talking about? Tell there me about this. Bride. I I don't remember it. That's why I was going to ask you if you liked it because it wasn't as rem memorable as the first one and why was that? Well, I know there was never a theatrical film, Princess Bride no, 2. Maybe on, there was, was. Maybe and there I was even some. Think Anne Hathaway was in it. Maybe there was some. Maybe th are you think, thinking of the Princess Diaries 2? No. Because <laughs> there was a Princess Diaries 2 with Anne Hathaway. Wait, like what? maybe there was some obscure little direct to home video movie or something like that. Oh Fact checker gosh, Jonathan, are you finding I am anything? Seeing little. No, Princess Diaries too, but I don't see Princess Bride. Oh my gosh, at Prince! All. I'm totally 
screwed up. You're right. Princess, di- you're Princess right. Diaries, Diaries too. too. I thought I was taking you crazy pills. Yeah, that makes sense with Anne Hathaway. <laughs> I'm like, how do I not know about a Princess Bride too? That'd be so yeah, crazy. That makes so much more sense because he was like timeless. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, okay. Five ago. Okay. Nathan Quayle writes, could we see a live action Voltron movie? Thanks. Oh my gosh. The people have been asking that question forever. Actually, let's go back to fact checker Jonathan. That who's, shirt. Who's sporting the old Voltron shirt there today as fate would have it. Um, here's the thing. And, and by the way, I mean, I'm, I'm a Lions guy, not a, what was it, 10 or 15 ships? Was it 10? I think it was 10. There are two Voltrons, right? I mean, there are probably more, but there are two main Voltrons. There's the five Lions, and then there's like this other Voltron, which was like 10 individual ships that came together to make a Voltron, mm-hmm. whatever. When I talk about Voltron, I'm talking about the Lions. Um, so here's the thing that happened. Back in, the way Voltron was created, if I'm remembering the history right, and correct me if I'm wrong, but... Voltron was created when this guy, this producer, took these two separate Japanese animated shows Mm -hmm. and kind of took them and kind of cut them together and then put English language over them and called it Voltron, Defender of the Universe, right? So, and he was the owner of Voltron. So anyway, now fast forward a bunch of years. So they decide, back in 2011, uh, this company that kind of owned the rights and Relativity Media, they announced that they're gonna start making a Voltron movie. Well, wait a second. Out of the woodwork comes these this Japanese company that owned those two original cartoons that Voltron was kind of chopped and, and Frankenstein together out of, right? And they say, whoa, whoa, whoa. When we gave you the rights to make your little show, it said nothing about movie rights. And then, like, for years, there has been this question of rights and the mm-hmm. ability to, to even have the legal right to make this movie. So it got kind of stymied. From what I understand, though... A settlement has recently been reached with that Japanese company. So I believe the the way is now paved that a Voltron movie can work. Whether that deal with Relativity Media is still in place or not, I don't know. That deal may have lapsed. Um, but I personally have not heard anything. Dennis or Jonathan, have you guys heard anything about a Voltron lately? No? Everybody's shaking their heads no? Out the top of your head. Yeah, so guys in the comment section, that's, that's the great thing about having... Mm-hmm. All the viewers, right. <laughs> there's tens of thousands of you guys. If you guys find anything definitive, um, drop it in the comment section. Leave a link to your source as well, because I'd be curious to know. But as far as I know, the company wants to make it. I believe the legal issues have been settled, I believe. Now it's just a matter of, of getting it done. And if there's movement or not, I'm not sure. You're talking about the creative process of how they put like English language basically over yeah. it. Do you think that sometimes the charm of it gets lost when it's translated into another language? Oh, could be. Because I, I remember, if I'm not mistaken, uh, look, I am not, I am not a, a, a historian nor, <laughs> re- nor remotely authoritative on the history of the Power Rangers. But if I'm not mistaken, I believe that's how the Power Rangers got made. Really? Yeah, the Power Rangers was, they oh got a bunch, gosh. they got a, these North American kids to act out certain scenes. But then all the scenes within the costume, that's from a, a, a Japanese show that then they, they took Whoa. and chopped together and then they edited it all together and then do, 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 there's the Power Rangers, right? <laughs> and so will it, would it lose some of its charm? The risk is certainly there. It would, it'll take a skillful hand to make it maintain its charm and, and that the nostalgia factor and to make it a great modern piece mm-hmm. as well. I hope a Voltron movie gets made. I really do. I, I mean, because I'm a spastic geek. I, I'd love to see it. That'd be awesome. <laughs> we'll see. Thomas Begman writes, Hi AMC, love your videos. With Joss Whedon confirming that he will not be returning to direct Infinity War Part 1 and 2, what will he do next? I think it would be a mistake if Disney didn't get Joss Whedon to direct a Star Wars movie, specifically Episode 9, and we know he wouldn't turn it down. I think his style would be great for a fun Return of the Jedi type movie. He can also direct the dark tones that Ryan Johnson will most likely be writing. I think it would be stupid if they didn't add Joss Whedon to to their already stellar A-list directing talent before he started on something else. He certainly has the connections at Disney, so I don't think this is too far-fetched. What are your thoughts on this? Well, everybody knows I am a huge Whedonite. I'm a huge Joss Whedon fan. I've, I've had the pleasure of interviewing him a number of times. He's, you know, he, uh, he held the infamous Joss Whedon d- uh, dance party at a party I threw at Comic-Con. Oh, what, gosh, yeah, oh yeah. Awesome. He, he is a great guy, and I'm, I, I love, I'm a huge fan of Serenity and Firefly and all that kind of stuff. He's not the right guy to direct a Star Wars movie. I, I, I said that from the beginning. Ever since, I remember going back now a while when it was announced that Disney bought Star Wars and they were going to make new Star Wars movies. Then it was all the big talk and all the big rage, not just about what will these movies be about, but who's going to direct it. 
And this was before J.J. Abrams came along. And I remember I said at the time, I love, 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 love. There's a couple of directors I really, really love. I love Peter Jackson. I love, uh, I, I love Joss Whedon. So there's a couple of those types of guys, right? But I said, but these guys, this isn't the right fit. I, I really don't think Joss Whedon is a fit for Star Wars. Are you saying Joss Whedon isn't good enough for Star Wars? No, no, no. It ain't about good enough. It's about fit. That's all. It's just about fit. And I don't believe his style matches that. Now, one of the things um, that Thomas asked in his email, he says, well, you know Joss Whedon would say yes to it. Not a chance in hell. No chance in hell does Joss Whedon. Even if Lucasfilm wanted to offer Joss Whedon the Star Wars gig, there is no chance in hell that Joss Whedon's going to say yes to it. No way. He's already been talking about how he is so looking forward to getting out of the Avengers world. Just because it, when you get into movies like this, it is all-consuming. And, you know, I remember I got together with him uh, shortly after he finished shooting, and I had a chance to interview him shortly after he, he finished shooting the first Avengers movie, and that dude was wrecked. <laughs> you could just see it in his eyes and his face, and he's trying to be so jovial and be his Joss Whedon self, but you could tell, man, this took its toll on him. I was actually a little bit surprised when he agreed to do the second one. But at this point, you know, Joss Whedon is a creative genius, and he has his own movies in his head that he wants to do. And right now, after Avengers Age of Ultron is a huge mega blockbuster hit again, he's going to have all the cachet in the world in Hollywood, and he's going to be able to get his movies made, the ones he wants to do. Because for the past five years now, he's just been working on other people's stuff. He wants to do his movies. And to sign up for Star Wars, which will be equally, if not more exhausting than Avengers, which is once again some big mega property owned by somebody else and is not really letting him get his creative groove on, I just don't think it's something he would do right now. I just yeah. don't think there's any chance he would do it. I read that interview where he said, like, I do not want to do anything. I want to do something that's my own. But how can you turn down Star Wars? Oh, that's my. That's legendary. I know. It would be so hard. It would be so. But I think the only way a guy, a true born geek like Joss Whedon can turn down Star Wars is if you're just coming off of doing five years of the Avengers. Yeah. Coming off of five years of doing a mega block of the Avengers, then you're kind of in a position where you can say, for my own mortality, I have to turn this down, or or he's going to go mad. Yeah, we saw him at me and Jonathan saw him at the Hunger Games carpet. He looked like I think it was the Hunger Games carpet. He just looked exhausted. I know, and he's always he always looks like that. He always looks like that. What do you think he's going to do next? If, uh, if honestly, honestly, he's he's going to. I believe he's going to step back. He's going to do like one or two small films. I totally believe. And if not small films, then projects that are just his that he writes from scratch that are his creations. Mm -hmm. uh, it won't be Serenity Two. It won't be a reimagined Firefly. It won't be anything like that. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, but um, he can get some stuff done now, and I think he's got like five years worth of creative ideas in his head that he wants to get off the ground. He deserves it. Yes, he does. Andrew McEwen writes, Hi, AMC. Watching your show is one of the highlights of my day. I was wondering if an actor had two movies come out in the same year and both were outstanding performances, could he slash she be nominated twice for Best Actor slash Actress, one for each role? What are the rules on that? Thanks, and keep up the great work. Um, as far as I know, as a matter of fact, an actor there's no rule against an actor being really? nominated twice. There's just not, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, in 1944, in the movie Going My Way, I don't know how they did this, but an actor by the name of Barry Fitzgerald uh -huh. was nominated for Best Actor and Best Supporting Actor oh. in the same movie. <laughs> in the same great. movie. Now, since after that happened, and I don't even know how that happened, but <laughs> since that. that happened, the Academy did instill a rule that says you cannot be nominated for both Best Actor and Best Supporting Actor for the same movie. That can happen. But that's really the only rule. Now, as a matter of fact, um, like let's take, for instance, you know, we hear about, uh, I, I believe this year, if, if I'm not mistaken, Dennis, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a composer this year was nominated twice this year for uh, Best Score. And that's happened sometimes. We know sound designers have been nominated for multiple movies in the same year. Steven Soderbergh, in the year 2000, was nominated for Best Director for two separate movies, for uh, Aaron Brockovich and for um, um, uh, d -d 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 Traffic. For Aaron Brockovich and Traffic, and I believe he actually won the Academy over Traffic. So there's no um, rule stating that. Now, we've also seen a bunch of examples over the years of actors who, while no actor has ever been nominated for Best Actor in two different movies, 
several actors have been nominated for Best Actor and Best Supporting Actor or Actress and Supporting Actress uh, in the same movie. Most recently, Kate Blanchett was nominated for Best Actress for Elizabeth and Best Supporting Actress for I'm Not There. That was in 2007. In 2004, Jamie Foxx was nominated for Best Actor for Ray, which he won, but he was also nominated for Best Supporting Actor in Collateral, the, the movie he did with Tom Cruise. He was really actually really good in that. Julianne Moore, who's probably going to win the Academy Award this year for Best Actress, but in 2002, she was nominated for Best Actress in Far From Heaven and for Best Supporting actress in The Hours. Emma Thompson, Holly Hunter, Al Pacino, Sigourney Weaver, Jessica Lange. These are all actors or actresses who have been nominated in the same year for both Best Actor in one film and Best Supporting Actor or Actress in another film. And so we've never seen Best Actor in two different films, but it can happen. So maybe maybe Leonardo DiCaprio will just crush it one year. <laughs> Finally win one and get nominated for like three movies in one year. It'd be interesting. Have. Do you think that's fair? I think that's kind of, I mean, it's fair, but that's kind of sucky for the mm. other actors that. Well, you know, here's, here's what I always say about stuff like that. If it's sucky for the other actors, then other actors, be better. <laughs> Try be, harder. Tr be better. If, you, if you're really upset about the fact that guy got not even two movies, because he beats your ass. Because he's that much better than you are. Because she's so much more ahead than you are. Instead of crying about it, be better. That's, I'm so that's what glad I'm you say. don't have children. <laughs> <laughs> Jordan Allen writes, Hey guys, just w wanted your guys' opinion on the 2012 Total Recall. It has not good reviews, but not expecting much from it going in and not comparing it to the old one. I thought it was a decent little action movie. <laughs> Plus, I like the performances given by Farrell and Beckinsale. Your thoughts? Uh, I'll, I'll say the real unpopular thing. I like the remake of Total Recall. I did. I wasn't jumping up and down saying, oh my God, this is a great movie. No, but I got to tell you, I walked in the theater. I watched it. Had a good time. Came out. I thought Colin Farrell's pretty good in it. Actually, um, the Kate Beckinsale, Jessica Biel fights in that movie were like awesome. I think I think that's a movie where they had like a fight in an elevator in this like close confined space. And like just the choreography of it was incredible. Brian Cranston, one of the very few major motion pictures we get to see Brian Cranston in. Um, was it an awesome movie? No, but I'm with you. I, I actually thought it was okay. I liked it. I had a good time with it, and I wasn't one of these guys that instantly jumped on the hate train for it just because it was a remake of a classic Arnold film. And I'm not saying that everybody who dislikes it dislikes it because of that reason. I'm sure there are many reasons to dislike the, the remake, but for me, it happened to work. What makes an action movie good to you? Is it the, the visuals, or is it the story behind mm. the visuals? Well. The first answer is a cop-out answer, which is it's a whole bunch of things that go into it. I, I think the keys for me, for me, a great action film, the number one key for me is a great villain. Now, a great villain is important in almost any genre of film, without a doubt. But for me, a great um, emotionally hooking villain if you can get bought into a villain in an action film, it just makes everything feel that much better. It makes all the action feel... Look, honestly, if it's not for Hans Gruber in, in the original Die Hard, I don't know. I mean, maybe Die Hard's just as good without Hans Gruber. But for me, Hans Gruber and just the fact that he's such an awesome, awesome villain, that elevates everything in that movie. It elevates the action, and it elevates the one-liners, it elevates the, the cheesiness, it elevates all of it when you've got that great villain, and when you don't have that villain, it can really hurt. So for me, it would be a great villain. That makes sense. Benny Lynn writes, Hi, AMC Movie Crew. Love the energy and excitement and enthusiasm you all bring to films. I was wondering if maybe Warner Brothers delayed Jupiter Ascending to February because of some specific effects as well as to capitalize on Eddie Redmayne's potential Oscar nomination and other awards at that time and Channing Tatum's growing star power. I'm hoping the movie is better than we all expect it to be because I'm a big fan of the Wachowskis and the talent involved. It probably moved because it sucks. Uh, <laughs> Um, I have not, like, I gotta say, I, right off the top, I have not seen Jupiter Ascending. I'm looking forward, and I think I'm gonna go see it this week, as a matter of fact. I think I'm gonna finally get a chance to see it this week. Um, but everything that I'm hearing about it is all horrifically bad. Ooh. Like, I've, I've even been hearing from people who have seen the movie, that I know have seen the movie, two separate people, completely independent of each other, who've seen the movie that said, Eddie Redmayne, who is one of the front runners for Best Actor this year, mm. um, for The Theory of Everything, that Eddie Redmayne is so legendarily awful in Jupiter Ascending 
they're saying his publicists are trying to distance him from the film to avoid a Norbit situation like Eddie Murphy uh, came across. They, they're, they're actually afraid it will hurt his Oscar chances. That's how bad he is in this movie. So that, that's just what I'm hearing. I got to go see it and see it for myself. Um, but Benny brings up a great, very plausible theory. You know, it became, look, we all have known for a long time that Eddie Raymond's probably going to be in conversation for the Oscar for Theory of Everything. And then now we know he's actually one of the front runners. There, when um, Fox Catcher started, the rumbling started going around, I think people knew that there was going to be some really serious discussion about the performances in that movie, one of which is Channing Tatum. Mm-hmm. And while Channing Tatum, I don't think, got close to getting an Oscar nomination, I think almost everybody universally agrees it is the best performance he's mm-hmm. ever given. That's a dude that just keeps getting better. I was I was really hard on Channing Tatum for a long mm-hmm. time. Like, this dude sucks, he's got no acting talent, and for a long time that was true. Mm-hmm. But this dude has worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and got better and better and better. Now, five years later, this dude doesn't deserve an Oscar nomination, but he is carrying his own in a movie with guys who are getting Oscar nominations. Couldn't imagine saying that three years ago. So th- this guy is just a, a testament. So maybe if they knew that, if they realized, hey, I bet Channing's going to get some buzz. I bet Eddie's going to get some buzz. This might really help our film if we move it closer to when the Oscars are going to happening. If that's the case, it's probably a pretty smart move. Smart. It's probably a pretty smart move. So we'll see how it all turns out. That's definitely smart. Do you think that it could hurt their careers if it is bad? Jupiter Ascending? Yeah. Yes. Aww. Yes. If, well, I mean, it depends. If it's that bad. Yeah. Now, the one good thing that Eddie Redmayne's got going for him is that he's fairly respected. Yeah. And everybody is so enamored with his performance in Theory of Everything. Yeah. While his PR people might be worried it might hurt his Oscar chances with Jupiter Ascending, the fact of the matter is, no matter how bad he is in Jupiter Ascending, in the long, grand scheme of things, the goodness of Theory of Everything will wash over um, any of the badness that's coming out of Jupiter Ascending. Yeah. Channing Tatum, like I said, he's just getting better and better and better. I, I don't think he can take... It's okay if the movie sucks for Channing. Is as long as he does okay in his role. If Channing does okay in his role, he'll be fine. If he really stinks it up, which I've not heard anything about Channing Tatum in this movie, by the way, one good or bad, I've heard nothing. So, as long as he holds his own, it'll be fine. But if he really stinks it up, just as people are starting to pay attention to him, that could set him back a bit. I hope. I hope he keeps on going. Poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon Vallejo writes, "Hi guys, love the show, and thank you for helping me keep up to date with my movie news. My question is, do you think that there is a chance that we'll see another The Mask movie with Jim Carrey in it? Thank you so much, guys, and keep up the great work." The original The Mask with Jim Carrey is so freaking funny. It takes me back. Me, I used, I tell the story a lot, but me and about three of my buddies, we rented a house together. We all lived in this house mm-hmm. together. And there was a few movies we used to just put in the VHS because we had no DVD at the time. We would put it in the VHS player and play it over and over and over and over again. One was Shaolin vs. Llama, this great, mm-hmm. awesome, cheesy kung fu movie. Um, another was Noises Off, which which is my favorite comedy of all time. Another was the Peter Gabriel Secret World Tour concert video from Italy. Because we were all, what? we were actually all musicians. <laughs> oh, um, all four of us living in the house were musicians. And it is just like, musicianship-wise, it is one of the best concert videos uh-huh. you can ever see. It's, it's insanely good. Anyway, and the fourth was The Mask. We would watch The Mask. And I would be lying to you. If I didn't tell you that at least 50% of the reason we kept watching The Mask over and over again was because of this brand new newcomer in the film by the name of Cameron Diaz, <laughs> who, I'm look, say what you want, what you think about Cameron Diaz now, or all this kind of stuff, that's fine. I'm, I'm not opening that up for debate. All I'm saying is Cameron Diaz in The Mask may be the hottest woman mm-hmm. ever on screen in any movie Ever. Not I'm not talking about up. other movies. I'm not talking about what else she's done or or is, you know, in the grand scheme of things, you know, is is Cameron Diaz as good looking as this woman or that one? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in that one movie. Mm-hmm. I don't know that any male or female has ever looked as good as Cameron Diaz did in that movie. And Jim Carrey was at, like at the height of his power, mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. Height of his comedic power. And then they tried to do, oh, dear heavens, they tried to do that pseudo sequel son of the mask mm. wow 
<laughs> well, I don't know why the studio had this thing in their pants about, hey, let's do a Jim Carrey sequel without Jim Carrey and make it stupid. So they did Dumb and Dumber uh, when Harry met Lloyd, which is just terrible. And then they did Son of the Mask, which is just terrible. Two great classic films from Jim Carrey. Um, would they do another one today? Nah. I, I think the Son of the Mask made the mask name a joke. And I, I, don't get me wrong, I'd love to see Jim Carrey do it, but he won't. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think we're going to see it happen. On the topic of Jim Carrey, did you ever see the movie The Number 23? I'm trying to forget it. Yeah, uh, yeah <laughs> I did. That was horrible. That was just a horrible, horrible movie. I mean, that movie was horrible before they started shooting it, though. <laughs> like, the script of that movie is just god-awful. And then it was poorly directed, no pace to it at all. And by the end of it, I'm just like, thank God this is over. Because mm -hmm. I'm actually, I'm a, fa I'm a big fan of Jim Carrey. Yeah. And I like him in com com comedic right. roles. I like him in dramatic roles. And I thought the number 23 offered, like, such a cool opportunity for him Definitely. to go darker, you know? Like, a serious darker as opposed to quasi-comedic mm -hmm. darker. And oh, what a flat, awful, terrible oh, movie. Wow, well, well, that's pretty much it, yeah. <laughs> well, I think that is the last question for today. All right. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. Um, just a reminder that if you want to check out some fabulous movies, go ahead and head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theaters, show times, and ticket information. If you want a podcast version of this episode, check out the description box below and click the thumbs up button. Thanks to the guys in the room, Dennis and Jonathan, and thanks to this guy, the editor in chief of AMC Movie News, John Campia. John, where can people find you online? You can find me on Facebook and on Twitter. Just follow me at John Campia. And you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Ashley Milva. Thank you guys again so much for tuning in and we will catch you next time. Bye.